our worship service, you will notice that there are times when we are hearing from God and times that we respond to him. And uh, you can follow along and you can pretty much understand when we're talking back to God and when God is talking to us. Uh, the first word in worship is God's. And we, we hear it through the psalmist in Psalm uh, 72 as we're called to worship. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. As we respond to God in that call to worship, let us sing number 236, To God Be the Glory. morning. Oh Lord God, we gather before you. Help us today to be numbered among the saints in whom Jesus takes delight. Let us find our food in doing your will, in walking in your ways. Let us enjoy the fellowship of the saints, being encouraged and strengthened by their company. And let us take our refuge in Christ, finding all our goodness in him. May he be our chosen portion and our refreshing cup. We pray in his name. Amen. The congregation, receive the Lord's greeting this day. To all those who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let us sing, uh, O God, beyond all praising, number 241 as our response to the Lord's greeting this day, number 241.
As we follow the Lord's will for our lives in the weeks as we gather together, we've been going through the Ten Commandments. We come this day to the Fifth Commandment. And please follow along in your bulletins with me. And God spoke all these words, saying, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Shall we go to the Lord in a prayer confession this morning? Our loving Father in heaven, we come confessing. We have broken this command again and again. We have rebelled against your fatherly care. We have not honored those that you have appointed for our good. And like proud children, we have fallen into thinking that we are wiser than you. We confess our disobedience and our ingratitude, our pride and our willfulness, and all other failures toward your authority. In the name of your Son, wash and forgive us, for in him we hope and come before you this day. Amen. If we've confessed our sins, we hear the promise of God that is ours in Christ Jesus. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The peace of the Lord be with you. And shall we sing in response, Thy works not mine, O Christ, number 460. From Psalm 138 this morning. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Let us pray. Almighty Lord, thank you for calling us here together today. And Father, we confess that we so often do not live as if we were looking at Jesus 
We worry and fret and chase after worldly things, neglect your word, and try to do everything in our own power. And we look to men for the truth and the wisdom we seek instead of coming to you. Lord, forgive us for this and strengthen our trust in you. O oh Lord, this morning we ask your guidance, mercy, and blessing on our congregation. We ask for your guidance for those who are going through hard decisions, those with difficult job situations, and for those who are searching for new employment. We ask your hand of blessing especially on the expectant mothers in our congregation and their husbands as well. We pray for your hand on all of us in our relationships with each other and in our families. Most especially, we ask your blessing on each of our young people for protection, for guidance. And yes, Lord, that each would soon come to know you and trust you and profess their faith and trust in your son, Jesus. Help us to faithfully teach our covenant children so that they may know you and the profound blessing of being able to someday say that they have known you from the beginning. And Father, we pray that you will bring back our prodigals. Grant us the joy of restored Christian faith and fellowship with them. And we ask your saving grace for our family and friends who do not yet know your son. We pray for your mercy, Lord, for healing for those who are sick right now, for those who are going through cancer treatments, facing surgery, and those who are now recovering from such. Comfort those who struggle with continuing medical problems. And we ask also your blessing, comfort, and help for those who take care of them. We pray for those who have been unable to be with us in person because of illnesses and will soon be healthy and can once again join us in fellowship and worship together. Father, you've told us that you will fulfill your purposes for each of us according to your plan, and we know that applies to nations and governments as well. So this morning we ask for our country and the government we have today that you would turn us back from the path we seem to be on. We ask that truth will prevail. We pray that greed and the abuse of power will be put down. We pray your favorable guidance for those you have put in government over us, and that there would be a great increase in wisdom and honesty in our rulers. We ask you to strengthen and empower the men and women in government who know right from wrong. And though they may be few today, grant them the power to stand up for truth rather than hiding and being silent. We ask that the talk and threats of war will be stopped. And whether you have us live in Babylon or Jerusalem, we pray that we might live quiet and peaceful lives. Continue to remind us that we serve a different king and our citizenship is in heaven. And we pray for your church, Lord. Keep her straight and true to your word and let all who lead and serve be clear and faithful to what you have taught. We pray that they may live holy lives and serve your people honestly because that's an awesome responsibility. We ask that you would grant each of them great discernment peace and strength in your son Jesus. <clears throat> we pray your blessing on our council as we prepare for our monthly meeting as well as for classes next month. And Father, we pray for those who serve your church. We ask for all of them and for us. Help us to stand and resist in the days of temptation that by your hand and your spirit we might overcome. Bless your church and raise up men to serve as deacons and elders. Lord, you know all that we hold in our hearts and the prayers that we have spoken out loud this morning. We're grateful for that. Let your steadfast love, O oh Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. Almighty Father, bless now our tithes and our offerings. May your Holy Spirit be with Pastor Jonathan as he brings your word this morning. Be with us as well. Grant us open ears and hearts to hear your message for us this day. And all these things we ask in Jesus' name. this time we have that wonderful opportunity as a response to God to bring our gifts and tithes to him. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all you produce.
As we prepare to hear God's word, let us turn to Psalm 75 in our Psalter hymnals. We give you thanks, O God. We'll stand as we sing. take our Bibles and we'll turn to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 11, and begin reading at verse 16 through verse 24, as we look to God's holy and infallible word. These are words that are given to us. The grass withers, the flower fades, but not the word of God, it remains forever. And let us bow and ask God's illumination here now on his word. Father, we thank you for your word, which not only gives light, but is light. Your word is light from light. Let the brightness of your word fill and illuminate each of our souls. Let the light of your word shine in the still, dim places of our hearts and minds. May it stir us more and more to fear your name and thus present ourselves in all our pursuits to you and for your glory. And in all of this, May our life become a living beacon of your light in this world. Your, world. your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. May it be so by the power of your spirit. We, for we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Savior. Amen. Matthew chapter 11 beginning with verse 16. Let me read verse 15 as well. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. 
But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have been remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. The Lord gives the word. And as the psalmist says, great is the company that proclaims it. These are difficult words here. Talk about the childishness of those who are rejecting Christ. And that some time ago I heard a description of, of a child's property rules. If it's mine, it's mine. If it's yours, it's mine. If I like it, it's mine. If I can take it from you, it's mine. If I'm playing with it, some, if I am playing with something, all the pieces are mine. If I think it's mine, it is. If I saw it first, it's mine. If I had it and then put it down, it is still mine. If you had it and you put it down, it is mine. If it looks like the one I have at home, it's mine. If it's mine, it must never appear to be yours in any way. If it's broken, it's yours. <laughs> Some of you recognize those kind of statements. You've heard, seen them heard and acted out in your own home as your children are at play. And childhood is supposed to be a, a phase uh, something that we grow out of. And we can be glad that most people mature. And there's, a, there's a kind of childishness that needs to be placed in the past. And even the Apostle Paul could say in 1 Corinthians 13, 11, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Jesus is going to use the picture of children playing in the marketplace to say something about the people of his and our generation. The picture that Jesus draws is quite simple and clear, and it applies not only to the people of Jesus' day, but more importantly, to all people that have that same childish attitude. Jesus was an acute observer of life. He even observed children's games. And today we're looking at Jesus' observation of children, which steps up Jesus' accurate observation of people, people who reject God for their own purposes. They are, in Jesus' words, like little children. But what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to their playmates. Jesus has an interest in all people. He observed them, they observed him, and he was familiar with all their ways. He knew all their games. He knew their spiritual condition and the ways in which they had rejected the gospel. He paid attention to the children in the street and he knew their nursery rhymes. He knew their taunts and their activities. So when Jesus is using children for this illustration, he's doing it with an understanding of the human condition. He does it, he's doing it without a degree of sentimentality about childhood. We have a tendency to sentimentalize children. It's, it's the reason politicians want to be photographed with them. Um, in this passage, Jesus is not giving us an idealistic picture of childhood at all. And the point of this illustration is that these children will not be pleased. Dan Doriani in his commentary calls them petulant, and petulant, and recalcitrant. They are the child that is hungry but won't eat. Won't eat fruit, won't eat meat, won't eat vegetables, won't eat bread, won't even eat the ice cream. The little miscreant, he says, will not eat. And Jesus has this image of pouting children, complaining to their playmates that they won't play their games and so no one plays. And this is not an endearing reference to children at all. What Jesus will say turns into a pronouncement about those who reject God's purposes, liking them to these petulant children. And one commentator referred to this passage as a parable of the brats. 
And so I want to say to you, first of all, you know what children are like. You know what your generation is like. And you know or you ought to know that there are eternal consequences. You know what children are like. It's right there in those first couple verses there. Children sitting in the marketplace calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. And Jesus is, addre- is addressing children, here. Uh, the, the word children here. He uses the diminutive form of, of children, meaning little children. But in fact, this, uh, this word for children could refer to children of any age. In fact, it can be used of grown men. And Jesus has, at one time even addresses his own disciples with that very word after his resurrection. He calls them children with that same phrase. Jesus' illustration is of children, of people who will not be pleased. In the Tyndale commentary, Professor Tasker writes, it is in this general characteristic of children at play to which Jesus directs our attention. They think they know what they want when in fact they do not. They tire so easily and so quickly at the game that they are playing and are constantly wanting to start something fresh. They are by nature restless and perpetually striving to obtain some further and more satisfying pleasure. And only too often because of their peevishness, their waywardness, and their discontent, the game ends in a quarrel. And it makes makes no difference then whether the game has been done of weddings or of funerals. We uh, recognize that as parents. We know what children are like. This is the picture that Jesus has in mind for these children who occupy the marketplace. Uh, The marketplace is the agora, uh, the center of community life. This was the open place where people worked. It was where goods were sold. It was where celebrations occurred. It's where funeral processions passed by, and this is where children played games. And the games that the children were playing were imitations of the rituals and and the activities that they saw in the streets of their cities. Weddings and funerals were the vivid occasions. And it seems like he is making a reference to that. That's at least what the commentators are telling us here. At at weddings, men would dance. And at the funerals, women would wail. And there's a good chance you know something of that. If you grew up at all before smartphones, when TVs only had three stations and children played outdoors till the street lights came on, then you might have played a variation of those games. Sometimes children would play the marriage game. They played the flute to encourage a merry dance around a boy and a girl who pretended to be bride and groom. Sometimes they played funeral. You be dead this time. And they pretend to cry around the one who pretended to be dead. But in this case, no one played Because no matter what was being offered up, it didn't suit them. They didn't want to play at all. We played the flute for you. You did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. In that parable, the active and passive children are both disagreeable. The one group wants to choose and control the game and the other refuses to join in. The children's play is paralyzed by individualized selfishness and ill-natured insistence on having their own way. And this is the kind of discontented peevishness that Christ is drawing attention to. He is not sentimentalizing here. He says if you look at these children in the marketplace that won't play with each other, their fickleness is is pictured in these noisy quarrels, rejecting either game, and putting an end to play. And then Jesus will say, you are like that. Nothing is good enough for you. You know what children are like. You also know what this generation is like. He says, for John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. 
Jesus is using these peevish children as insight into the spiritual condition of those who refuse his grace, who are always looking to, for someone else or some other thing. And Jesus understood that it didn't matter who preached to them. They simply refused to have anything to do with the salvation that God was offering them. And it's a remarkable picture there. Imagine that you're sitting in that audience that Jesus is addressing. His disciples have gone out to proclaim the gospel as he sent them out. And now there's a crowd before him. And he says to them, I want to tell you what you're like. You're like children in the marketplace. Who is he talking about? Who does he think he is? They draw back with their tucked in chin. I'm not a child in the marketplace. I'm a leader in this marketplace. I'm not a, I'm not a child in this marketplace. I'm a business owner here. I, I manage this market. It wouldn't run without me. I'm, I'm the provider of the goods here. There wouldn't be a market if I wasn't here. Another says, what? Who's he talking to? I'm no child. I'm the security in this place. Another inwardly protests, I'm not a child, I'm, the, I'm an educator here, a teacher of the law. And they all looked at himself, each other and they said, who's he talking about? It's the attitude of the critic that won't be satisfied. It's the description of the cranky bunch who gives a thumb down, thumbs down to whoever God sends to them. You're never going to be satisfied, you're never going to be content, you're never going to have ears that hear, you're never going to listen. What's the reality of this picture? That attitude was present in Jesus' day, and I suspect it's present in our day as well. He, you know, in, in Idaho, there's only 12% of the people who identify as being an evangelical who attend church weekly. Okay, out of 100 people, 12 people who say they're, they're an evangelical, who say they believe in God, who say they, uh, they know who Christ is. Only 12%, 12 people out of that 100 will show up in church weekly. Your neighbor may profess some vague belief or understanding of who Christ is, but is there any real interest in knowing the holiness and wrath of God or of his love and forgiveness? I don't have time for those messages. I'm not going to play that game. Why don't they gather with God's people? Because they don't want the message of either John or Jesus. You know, Wilbur Reese characterized this generation in a poem titled Three Dollars Worth of God. I would like to buy three dollars worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk or a snooze in the sunshine. I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want the warmth of the womb, not a new birth. I want a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. I would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. But God will not be that kind of convenience. And Jesus has given us two examples here. These people don't like John and they don't listen to Jesus. All they want was a God small enough to compromise with and pretend that their imperfect keeping of the law was adequate for a salvation that they would merit. For John came, neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. John was this unconventional figure, but John stands out before them, not as this wild man of the wilderness, but as an Authentic representation, a real prophet bearing the word of God. The last of the Old Testament prophets who breaks that prophetic silence. He comes with this direct message from God. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And with John they want a flute. Can you just play me something nice? Something cheerful, something undemanding. Some, just three dollars worth. Uh, but John fasted and talked about sin. They found him too gloomy and they wanted something brighter. John had a message. He's calling on them not to just simply play at funerals, but to do something real, to mourn, to mourn over their sin and repent, 
to mourn over their spiritual state of their country, uh, of their church, of themselves, to repent of their plight and pride and recognize that if the Messiah Christ came at that juncture, he would not only judge them, but he would judge all of Israel. John had a very sober message. He calls on them to mourn and they won't play. They don't see anything in their life to be ashamed of. They believe all is well. They could be saying, you know, there's enough sin to go around here and yet never acknowledge their own. Sometimes in church you get the impression that people are unaware that the church itself might be terminally ill. When a preacher like John comes along and calls them to repent, who's he talking to? They look at themselves and they don't want to play. They want nothing to do with the observation of how, how cold or, or dead they could be because they, they're so busy finding fault with others. They want nothing to do with the radical humility that leads to a radical discipleship. They won't play. And when someone has the audacity to tell them to repent of their sins, that message is rejected. Instead of seeing the seriousness of the message, uh, that, 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 that message comes out as wild. And, and, and they, they say, those people are maniacs. The, those fundamentals, uh, they're maniacs. They have a demon. By focusing on the wrong issue, they focus on John's diet and how he looked. And they don't get to the major concern and look to themselves and where they stand before God. So then God does speak to them in a different way. He speaks to, through them to them through the Son of Man, through Jesus Christ himself. And, and, and they're still fickle. The Son of Man, Jesus says, about himself, came eating and drinking. And they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Jesus tells you how he came. I came eating and drinking. But they say, He's, in fact, Jesus is pointing about, out the normalcy of his own life. He's a regular member of, of, of society with them. He, he enters into people's hearts, into their lives, into their homes. And as far as one could make out, Jesus would go and sit with anyone. It might have been the wedding feast in Galilee or the dinner with Simon uh, the ruler or... or, or Levi the lowlife or Simon the leper. It didn't matter to him if he supped with a despised tax collector like Zacchaeus or had a simple meal with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. It doesn't matter who asked him. There's no unwillingness on Jesus' part to eat or drink with any of those who will receive him. No doubt he drank wine with them, unlike John, who the angel of the Lord had told his father, Zechariah, he's not to take wine or fermented drinks. But what is the attitude that they have toward Jesus? Look at him, a glutton and a drunkard. Now that was pure slander. Pure slander. There's one thing that we can be absolutely sure of. In reality, no one ever saw Jesus drunk. Uh, and instead of receiving Jesus, they slander him. And what was Jesus' message after all? Was it really a different message than John? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In actuality, Jesus is just as stern as John was. He, he's, but he is the Jesus that you can't ignore. He, he had bold confrontations with them as well. There will be awful judgments coming from the lips of Jesus, far more challenging than those of John the Baptist, you might say. However, with Jesus, there's a different emphasis. It is if Jesus has come and said, John's work was to warn you of the judgment, but if you will listen to the warning, I promise you God will receive you, forgive you, and begin life anew in you on account of me. Jesus went to parties and talked about salvation. He was exhilarating, and they wanted something far more sober. Do you realize, Jesus, what's happening in our world today? There are two sides of the message, and I hope you have heard proclaimed those things. Yeah, I, I hope that you heard the law come and also the gospel 
I, I pray that that's what we hear when we come together on, on Sundays. The gospel comes to us, but it's preceded by a warning. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And the news of this kingdom, the kingdom that, says, uh, that draws near in Jesus Christ digs down far deeper than a shallow understanding of Satan's evil kingdom. And it soars far higher than the low view that we might have of the glories of God's kingdom. But they don't play. They don't play with John. They don't play with Jesus. John is too weird. Jesus is too exhilarating. In other words, they won't mourn and put to death sin. They won't do funerals and they won't do weddings. The weddings were a sweet picture of Jesus preaching because he's often saying, come to the wedding feast because the table is set. See, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you can find. John came saying you must mourn and Jesus says you must come and rejoice. But it doesn't matter which message came. They won't listen. They won't respond to either the holiness and wrath of God or the, the love and forgiveness of God. They object that the church is too judgmental or that it's too soft on sin. To talk of sin is too gloomy and they demand something brighter. They reject the severity of the law because they want more liberty. But when they hear of grace, parties, and salvation, they want solemn discussions of the morals of our society. And they want a religion with tight reign. But no matter how God speaks to his people, unbelief is never satisfied. Contrary to what we often assume, unbelief is not thoughtful and rational it is twisted and it is perverse. It's easy to be critical about anything and everything without entering into that saving, wonderful relationship with Jesus Christ. You know what children are like. You know what this generation is like. And you know or you ought to know that there are eternal consequences. In verses 20 through 24, it says, Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. <coughs> Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, Will you be exalted to the heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you have been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you, it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. Because the generation will criticize both John and Jesus, Jesus war warns them that Resistance to the message of the gospel is not just making them culpable, it makes them damnable as well. And he pronounces a woe. And that woe is not a grim call for vengeance. It's a compassionate warning still of the eternal judgment that is coming because of their own making. Jesus is speaking of the eternal consequences for some of those in the cities that rejected him, specifically here, the cities of Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. You know, Capernaum was Jesus' base of operation. He had left Nazareth to go to Capernaum. We read about that in Matthew chapter 4. And, and, and Matthew declared that, that when Jesus came to Capernaum, this was what was fulfilled, what was spoken of Isaiah the prophet. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and the shadow of death, a light had dawned on them. Chorazin was two miles from Capernaum. Bethsaida was the hometown of Jesus' four leading disciples of Peter and Andrew and James and John. And this is where most of Jesus' 
mighty works had been done. You know, when you read the end of the book of, uh, of, of John, in John 21, and John 21, verse 25, it, it says there about Jesus' works that were every one of them uh, to be recorded, the world itself could not contain the book that would have been written. We have a fraction of the mighty works of Jesus. The majority were done here. And there was a rejection. This region, these three cities that Jesus had performed most of his mighty works, his miracles, his dunamis, his, that's where we get that word dynamite, these mighty works. He proved by those mighty works that the age of salvation had come. And these cities had witnessed those miracles that attested to, to Jesus, the Messiah, the long-predicted Messiah. And, and these cities remained indifferent. And an indifference toward the, the message of Jesus Christ is, an, is sin. And when one has that message and one clearly can see the truth, there is the more greater responsibility. I know that even in our home, own homes, we have that testimony. Uh, the prophecy made more clear. Jesus begin, brings out the enormity of this sinful indifference by calling to mind Tyre and Sidon. Those were powerful cities that for centuries lived in close proximity to Israel. The prophets that spoke to Israel also condemned those cities in Isaiah 23 and Ezekiel 26 through 28 for their no notorious arrogance, godless character. Those prophecies against Tyre and Sidon were fulfilled in 332 B.C., 332 years before Christ came on the scene when Alexander the Great and his armies sacked and laid waste those cities. And if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Chorazin and Bethsaida are to be judged more severely because they had more exposure to the Son of God. Privilege brings a certain responsibility. Increased privilege brings increased responsibility. And we have in verse uh, 23 and four, 24 this other illustration about Capernaum. Will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the, if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. The people of Capernaum apparently thought quite highly of themselves in their city, but they were dwelling in darkness and in the shadow of death. Jesus, the light, had warned them that they were in danger of being brought down to Hades, brought down to the place of the dead, brought down to Gehenna, brought down to hell itself, brought down to the final judgment. And, and it wasn't just simply a, a warning about the physical destruction, the historical destruction that took away a city of, of, of Sodom. It was a warning about the eternal judgment to come. They were facing that eternal judgment for rejecting and refusing Christ. It would be torment in Hades and not heaven bliss that would be on their horizon. And Jesus declared if Sodom had seen the works that Capernaum saw, Sodom would still exist because those people would have repented. The wicked Sodomite who tried to rape an angel would receive a lighter judgment than the people who knew of Christ's mighty work. Imagine standing before the judgment seat of Christ and hearing him say, I know about your life. I know the psalms, the hymns, and the, and the carols that you heard. I know the light that you had. I know what was presented in word and sacrament before you. You had a Bible preached to you week in and week out, but you didn't repent. Therefore, your punishment will be worse than what I poured out on Sodom. There's no evidence that those towns ridiculed Jesus. They were just impenitent. They were just unbelieving. They were just indifferent to the things of God. Oh, they might have been amazed by his teaching. They, they, might have, they, they might have been amazed by those wonderful works. They were impressed by those words and works. No one spoke like this man. They were respectable. They were self-righteous, but they were unmoved. 
respectable people, yet unrepentant people, exposed to the truth of Jesus Christ, and they will receive the severest punishment in hell. And we can't be fooled. There's only one escape from that judgment, that woe. If you've never gone to the cross of Christ as a beggar with nothing in your hand, making no excuses, offering no justifications, then don't let another day pass before you get your life settled with God. That's the way of wisdom. You know, there, there are eternal consequences that we ought to know. You know, there's one other thing about eternal consequences here in this passage. Uh, you know, when I went through this passage, and I, I skipped over a little verse, part of a verse, verse 19. I didn't mention the one thing where Jesus said, yet wisdom is justified by our deeds. Wisdom. There's a personification of wisdom here. And, and, and Jesus is likening himself to wisdom. All that he is, all that he does, is justification and clear proof that we might believe in him. And in personifying himself as wisdom, Jesus is taking us back to the Old Testament, to places like Proverbs 8, and the New Testament shows us by allusions uh, it, to this Proverbs 8 in both Colossians chapter 1 and Revelation chapter 3 that this personification of wisdom is ultimately the person of Christ in whom are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In, in 1 Corinthians 1.30 it says, He became for us wisdom from God. And as wisdom is personified, the one who was with God at the beginning says in Proverbs 8, Blessed is the one who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting beside my doors. For whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who fails to find me injures himself. All who hate me love death. Wisdom's works are Jesus' works. And Jesus is justified by his works. He demonstrates who he is. It proves who he is. And Jesus' message in the mighty works are signs of what he has done. And they've been written down for us so that, as John says, so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you might have life in his name. In the parallel passage uh, to uh, this passage that we have in Luke chapter 7, uh, verse 35, there's a, a broadening understanding of this personification of wisdom. For there Jesus says, yet wisdom is justified by all her children. Are you one of wisdom's children? Jesus is talking there about those who would believe in him. And there is an eternal consequence to believing in him. That these are the new people that wisdom creates, created through the gospel of Jesus Christ, genuine disciples, spiritual children in the faith. They're the remarkable ones who acknowledge the truth of Jesus' teaching, despite the fact that they're that generation out there, that critical mass out there that's rejecting Jesus. The, following, the followers of Jesus are living witnesses to the wisdom of God. These are the ones who receive salvation as God has given it to them. The, the children of wisdom are, are those who are justified by faith. They are the ones who have been made wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Are you living as one of wisdom's children? Are you one of wisdom's works? It is one thing to connect the ill-humored and peevish children to those outside the church, outside of Christ. But what about ill-humored and peevish inflexible people who call themselves Christians. That 88% who said they're evangelical. It's all e too easy to slip into the role of those who miss God's plan because we insist on our own gain. We are the ones who are hard to please. We're the ones who find it so easy to criticize others. What is the gospel according to you? Are you advancing the kingdom of Christ as wisdom's children? Or are you advancing your own curated kingdom and shibboleth? Is God's wisdom justified in your behavior? Is the one who became for you wisdom, righteousness, and sanctification being revealed more and more in you? 
Wisdom's children are humble. They have never gotten beyond putting to death sin and being united to Christ. They are ready for the law and the gospel. They are waiting for the wedding and the funeral. They dance and they mourn because they know themselves to be simul justus et peccator, at the same time justified and sinful. History records the liberating power of those who are truly humbled by their sin and Jesus' salvation. There was a revival that took place in 1742 in a, in a parish uh, of Cambuslang, Scotland. The minister of the parish, Mr. McCullough, noticed a difference in his people. The formerly covetous and worldly-minded and selfish have got a public spirit and a zealous concern for promoting, for promoting the kingdom and the glory of Christ in the conversion and salvation of souls. And for this end, they are careful not only to live inoffensively themselves, but usefully to others, so as all about them may be better for those. They, are zealous for concern, they have a zealous concern for promoting the kingdom and glory of Christ in the conversion and salvation of souls. They are careful not to live offensively. Be thou my wisdom and thou my true word. I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great father, I thy true son. Thou in me dwelling and I with thee one. Can you say that as wisdom's children? May that be the occupation of your heart. Thou with me dwelling and I with thee one. You think about that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, may the vision of a dying world be set before our eyes. May we feel the heartbeat of its need and hear its feeble cry. May you, Lord Christ, revive your church in this, her crucial hour. Lord Jesus Christ, awaken your church with spirit-given power. The warning bell of judgment tolls. Above us looms the cross. Around us ever dying souls. How great. How great the loss. O Lord, constrain and move your church, the glad news to impart. And Lord, as thou dost stir your church, begin within our hearts. Father, this is our prayer. May we be wisdom's children. And may we meet the clamoring din and distress around us with your love and tenderness. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Congregation, let us sing of being wisdom's children by singing tis not that i did choose thee number 428 as our closing hymn we'll stand to receive that parting blessing of the lord may god put his name upon his children this day as he pronounces his blessing over them. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.